Good afternoon, and welcome to the second webinar in our six-part series on sexual harassment and assault in the workplace, brought to you by our working group comprised of members from the Section of Civil Rights and Social Justice, the Commission on Women in the Profession, the Commission on Domestic and Sexual Violence, the Commission on Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity, and the Young Lawyers Division. My name is Paula Shapiro, and I am the Associate Director of the Section of Civil Rights and Social Justice. I encourage you to check out the section's website, www.americanbar.org slash CRSJ for news and information, as well as replays of our great programming, all of which are focused on the impact of our current administration on civil rights and civil liberties. During today's program, you can ask questions of our panelists by finding the questions box on the right-hand panel and typing your question. You may also access our five handouts by locating the handouts, handouts dropdown and clicking on there. Finally, we will be sharing a recording of this program to everyone who is registered so that you can share it widely with your network. Please feel free to leave us, leave us feedback or ask questions in order to follow up. I will now turn it over to our longtime council member and leader, Kristen Gallus. Hey, uh, thanks, Paula. As she said, my name is Kristen Gallus, and I'm a division director for the section of civil rights and social justice. And what that means is uh, I'm on the council and I work with many of our uh, 20 uh, substantive committees and help them navigate the uh, CRSJ and the ABA to work on ABA policy, amicus briefs, and put together programs uh, such as this one. Um, as I said, CRSJ has over 20 substantive committees uh, dealing with women's rights. Uh, LGBT rights, Native American rights, immigrant rights, First Amendment, privacy, religious freedom, environmental justice, economic justice, in many, many uh, areas that hopefully people here on this uh, program uh, will be interested in. Uh, we're also the home of the YLD uh, project on uh, bully proof, and you can learn more about these substantive committees uh, on our website. Uh, and if you're looking for a way to get involved in civil rights, even if that's not your day-to-day -day job, hopefully you'll go to the website and you'll see that the section of civil rights and social justice is the place where you can go and get involved in these issues. Uh, even if you're not, this isn't your regular field of expertise. We're a small, really friendly section uh, where you can meet civil rights giants or you can be a newbie gaining leadership of your own. So if you're a law student, a young lawyer, or been in the ABA forever, uh, you can come make a difference within uh, the section of civil rights and social justice. Uh, now, hopefully that we've convinced you to go join our section. Uh, let's take a look at today's program and today's uh, uh, speakers. Um, as Paula indicated, uh, our section, along with uh, the Commission on Women in the Profession, the Commission on Domestic and Sexual Violence, and the Young Lawyers Division, put together a six-part a webinar series, and I want to emphasize this is a free webinar series. It's you know how often do you get free stuff from from the ABA? Um, so we've put this together uh, to address various issues dealing with sexual harassment in the workplace and elsewhere. Uh, we're leading up to the annual meeting in Chicago in August, where we will uh, have a presidential showcase that will be live and in person. So these webinars, one you can listen to them live, and then uh, you can also uh, look at them uh, on the website later on, but in August, it'll be the live uh, program. Uh, our first program provided some great background on sexual harassment and what it is, where it comes from, and how the law developed. Uh, today's program kind of takes a look at you know, the spotlight that the Me Too movement has put on sexual harassment in the workplace and how uh, for decades, victims have suffered in silence, afraid to speak out. Uh, now, with the Me Too movement, they're becoming emboldened to speak out, and they want change, and they want accountability, and so they're um, they're looking for help. And but once they do so, once they, they step forward and they seek legal redress, what kind of justice can they actually receive? Uh, what kinds of legal barriers do they face? Uh, you know, many people, including uh, lawyers, are really surprised to find out just how stacked the law is. Uh, against uh, sexual harassment claimants. It's even more stacked against sexual harassment claimants than it is against other discrimination uh, claimants. So the first part of our program today is going to focus on some of those barriers, uh, mostly looking in the context of Title VII. The second part of our program uh, will look at recent bills uh, at both the federal and the state level that have been passed or in, are pending uh, 
uh, to address some of the barriers uh, that we mentioned here. Uh, so hopefully today's program will generate a discussion um, you know, amongst yourselves within the ABA uh, in order to start focusing on, wow, these barriers exist, they shouldn't exist, what can we do in order to get rid of those barriers? So uh, now on to our speakers. Uh, the first part of our program will be, uh, will be Deborah Katz. Deborah Katz is founding partner at Katz Marshall and Banks in Washington, D.C. Those of you who practice uh, employment law or women's rights law probably already know Debbie and are very familiar with her work. Uh, she concentrates her practice on sexual harassment, employment discrimination, retaliation, whistleblower claims, uh, etc. Uh, she has received numerous accolades as best lawyer this, super lawyer that, uh, and she's often cited as uh, an expert on sexual harassment in such important publications as the Washington Post, the New York Times, Time Magazine. Um, the Human Resource Magazine identified her as one of the nation's top 10 plaintiff attorneys to fear the most. That's that's the, uh, the one that I like best. Uh, Debbie graduated Phi Beta Kappa and summa cum laude from Union College. Uh, she then graduated from University of Wisconsin uh, Law School, where she was a member of the Wisconsin Law Review and an articles editor of the women's uh, Law Journal. Uh, she's active in the plaintiff's bar nationwide. Our second speaker is Jess Stender. Jessica is senior counsel at Equal Rights Advocates in uh, San Francisco. She'll tell you a little bit more about uh, Equal Rights Advocates when she speaks, uh, but her work focuses on equal pay, sexual harassment, and other issues related to sex discrimination in employment and education. Uh, before joining ERA, Jessica was the legal director at, Sen at the Center for Migrant uh, Rights, where she worked on behalf of uh, low-wage migrant workers. Before that, she was a civil rights fellow of the public interest firm of Goldstein, Borgen, Durarian, and Ho. Uh, and she graduated from Bolt Hall College of Law at Berkeley, where she was an editor of the Berkeley a Journal of Employment and Labor Law. But most importantly for, for us, she is the co-chair of the section of civil rights and social justice is, um, Committee on the Rights of uh, uh, Women. Okay. All right, so let's get to the first part of our uh, program. Um, you know, Debbie gets calls from plaintiffs all the time to deal with some of these issues. So we're gonna try to <clears throat> address some of these through that process. So we put together a little scenario here where we have uh, Jane works as a concessionaire at an arena used for local events, concerts, et cetera. She only works a couple nights a week certainly not full time. Uh, she says that she has put up with sexual harassment for years by her boss. The boss is not the person who hired her. Uh, the person who hired her is nowhere on site, is off somewhere in cyberspace. Uh, but he is the person who decides if she gets to work on what days and during what hours. Uh, she has suffered in silence out of fear of retaliation, but she's been emboldened by the Me Too movement and now she wants legal help. So presuming Jane has found her way through the maze of trying to find a seasoned plaintiff attorney and has come across Debbie Katz. Debbie, what kind of, if she comes into your office, what kinds of legal hoops does she face or that you're gonna explore in your very first meeting with her? Okay. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for including me in this important uh, uh, panel today. Um, it is true that we are getting many, many calls from people who are emboldened to come forward as a result of the Me Too movement. Um, one of the first significant barriers that women have always faced in coming forward is the feeling that they would not be believed and they feared retaliation. And having a social movement, which is helping change perceptions about how really how bad and endemic sexual harassment is and um, that there are real structural barriers in the workplace that allow this to happen, we are now seeing a cultural shift and a perception shift, which is making more people come forward. The problem is the law still contains many serious barriers. The law is not keeping pace with what we now as a country are saying, this is unacceptable workplace behavior. So the first thing that I'd look at when this woman comes forward is, does she have coverage under, under EEO law? So first, looking at Title VII, it's the federal law that protects individuals from discrimination in the workplace on the basis of gender, race, national origin, religion. And the Supreme Court in Meritor Savings said that 
protecting somebody from sexual harassment protects you from sexual harassment in the workplace. I'm sorry, sex discrimination is a, um, protects you from sex, um, try it again. Protections from sex <laughs> discrimination protects you from sexual harassment. So uh, the first question in your scenario is, is she covered? And the first question that I would need to ask her is, how many employees does your employer have? Title VII only covers employers with 15 or more employees. So the fact that she is a part-time worker or only works sporadically would not preclude her from being covered as long as her employer is covered. A part-time employee does have protection under Title VII. What happens in many cases is uh, that employers try to say that the individual is not covered because they're an independent contractor. And if someone is an independent contractor, they're not covered under federal Title VII uh, EEO law. So um, in looking at whether somebody is an independent contractor, the, the courts look to uh, uh, whether the employer has a requisite degree of control over how the person conducts their work. And the reason that employers want to say someone is an independent contractor as opposed to an employee is if they're an independent contractor, they're not covered by Title VII. The other thing is that the employer then is not taking, uh, is, is, is paying them, but is not providing other kinds of crucial benefits. So you see uh, often with very vulnerable members of the workforce that employers are improperly classifying people as independent contractors. So the first thing is I'm going to say, look, it sounds like you are an employee. You're going to work. You're doing what this employer is telling you to do. Um, and that's the first threshold is, yes, titles. Title VII would apply to you. If she works for an employer that has fewer than 15, I'm going to look to see what state or uh, locality she works under to see if there may be coverage for smaller employers. Now, are there any, if if for some reason, whether in this scenario or some other scenario, if someone is an independent contractor, are they just kind of out of luck or do they have any other types of remedies to, to address sexual harassment? Well, you'd, ha you'd really be looking at, at state law. Um, they have no remedies as an independent contractor under federal law for sexual mm -hmm. harassment. Uh, and I want to get a uh, give a shout out here. Uh, um, the National Women's Law Center actually did some research on that and produced for us that California, Washington State, and uh, New York City's human rights law are three of the jurisdictions that expressly deal with uh, cover independent contractors in this scenario. So this is um, clearly a place that the ABA should be looking at encouraging a broadening of laws. Now, obviously, we're in a desperate moment on the federal level. I don't <laughs> see anything happening good uh, to expand Title VII, but states, and, and uh, Jessica's going to speak to this, states really need to be taking the lead in this area to protect workers. Uh, you know, the other thing this raises for me is that, you know, Title VII is part of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. You know, right next to that is Title VI, which deals with uh, race discrimination. Um, <clears throat> well, there's all, Civil Rights uh, Act also deals with race discrimination in public accommodations. So whether you're talking about, you know, motels, you're a customer or whatever, um, you know, are there any federal laws out there that address sex discrimination in the context of publications that might expand uh, sources of remedy? Well, unfortunately, Title VI of the Civil Rights Act does not apply to gender, which is crazy. Um, it, 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 it addresses race discrimination. So um, there may be other civil rights laws like the Fair Housing Act, but um, and in terms of Title VI, there is no coverage. I just want to, if you don't mind, just jump back to something I neglected to say sure. about the difference between sure. state and federal law. So anybody uh, who practices in this area, if somebody walks into your office, it may be that there's coverage under Title VII, but state laws may be far more generous. So in D.C., where I practice, under the D.C. Human Rights Act, um, the um, coverage is one employee or more. So you don't have to meet the 15 employee threshold, but more importantly, the DC Human Rights Act has no caps on damages. You can go directly to court, and we'll talk about that a bit later. So there's no exhaustion requirement. And you can sue individuals for aiding and abetting discrimination or sexual harassment. So it is a far more potent law. And we see increasingly states that we have, you know, we have progressive or more progressive uh, state houses where they are allowing uh, 
better uh, coverage, better laws, and more remunerative laws, because that is one of the barriers for uh, people coming forward with sexual harassment claims. In 1991, Congress amended Title VII to allow a structure of damages, but even for a large employer, um, the damages for, sec for sexual harassment or any form of discrimination are for compensatory and punitives combined, it's $300,000. That amount has not gone up since 1991. That's outrageous. So while many people um, from Chamber of Commerce and elsewhere will say, oh, people file these claims because they want to get rich. This is not a way to get rich. These are really hard claims. And the damages have not kept pace. Uh, we're still looking at 1991 numbers. So the DC Human Rights Act, which has no caps on damages, is a much better law. Uh, and California has better laws, New York, New York City. So you're going to need to look to state laws and protect potentially um, minis um, localities, um, counties, which may very well provide much better uh, remedy. Well, and that also applies to public accommodations laws. Some of the states have uh, public accommodations laws that address sex. Uh, and as you mentioned, the Fair Housing Act, our, our next uh, program in our sexual harassment series is going to focus on sexual harassment in the context of fair housing. Uh, and for those of you that uh, want to get involved in the ABA, another area that we're looking at is putting together and promoting a policy on uh, sex discrimination in public uh, accommodations. So, all right, moving on to the next topic, we, we've looked at whether she's covered, you know, one of the things that we uh, hear about a lot in the Me Too movement, uh, it, it's in the press a lot, are these things called mandatory arbitration clauses that would prevent you from maybe from going to court. Uh, what are those and how do they affect uh, the client that comes in uh, to your office? Mandatory arbitration provisions are uh, uh, tilt strongly in favor of corporations who want no transparency and want no public record of claims brought against them. And what they do is they require someone to go before arbitrators uh, in a typically confidential proceedings uh, to adjudicate their claims of sexual harassment. And we now know from egregious cases like Fox with Roger Ailes uh, that forcing people into mandatory arbitration really, uh, it, it, it allows recidivist harassers to go on forever and ever and settlements get paid as a cost of doing business but there's no public record so there's no scrutiny there's no accountability and those of us in the plaintiffs bar uh, vigorously fight against these cases going into uh, mandatory arbitration there's a repeat player phenomenon where arbitrators tend to favor the companies that continue to go back to them there's a lot of literature on that that arbitration favors uh, favors companies, remedies are far less than what juries would award. So uh, in this Me Too era, we now really recognize that mandatory arbitration provisions are one of the tools that employers use that allow sexual harassment to continue with impunity. So they're very bad and we have to fight against them. Uh, Jessica, you're, you're jumping. <laughs> I, was just, I would just <laughs> add that um, if it wasn't already assumed that usually the employer pays the arbitrator. So the repeat player, kind of picture includes that they know who's buttering their bread so to speak but you know Good what point. in some cases one one of the arguments that arbit, uh, that companies make or those on the defense bar make is that arbitration is less expensive it's a faster mechanism and that's just not true and we have cases where our clients are forced into arbitration where the agreement says that they pay half the cost of arbitration mm. and that i mean consider that three judge arbitration in a single plaintiff case, instead of having to pay a filing fee and get a court to adjudicate your claim, you're having to pay an arbitrator. And a case that we had recently, the, the fee at the end of it for the plaintiff was $180,000 to pay for the cost of arbitration that went over multi years. It wasn't fast, it wasn't efficient, wow. and it was obscenely expensive. So wow. uh, that, that, that's a real problem uh, with arbitration. Uh, well, but, let's, pres let's presume that we don't have an arbitration clause here and we're looking at she's come to you. She's endured this sexual harassment. Um, you know, some of what are you looking at in terms of a deadline? Sometimes you hear the some of the Me Too people 
movement people, they talk about things that happened quite some uh, time ago. Uh, but what kinds of time restrictions are there on potential plaintiffs? Well, it depends on whether you're talking about federal or, or state claims. So I'm going to talk about Title VII. Um, the, there are two different deadlines that apply depending on whether uh, the state in which the harassment took place is, is a deferral agency state, meaning if it is a state that has a similar uh, uh, agency whose charter is similar to the EOC. So if there is no deferral agency like this, uh, the charge must be filed within 180 days. If there is a deferral agency, it's 300 days. And for federal workers, it's 45 days, federal, federal agency workers. So, I mean, that's breathtakingly fast and people can miss their statute of limitations quite so easily. If you go on vacation and come back, you might miss your uh, time period if you're, you know, work for the Department of Agriculture. Well, that's a long vacation, but yeah, well, I, your point is well taken. But um, yeah, it's it's just ridiculously fast. Now, state aid, state laws differ. Um, the DC Human Rights Act, we have one year. Um, New York City has now expanded this, I believe, to two years. So you're having to look at where the longest statute of limitations is, because people do come uh, to lawyers sometimes really late. I mean, they've suffered in silence for a really long time and then something happens and then it takes them a, a while to, to get up the courage to come forward. And we are hearing from many people who who now feeling the backing of this Me Too movement and all this energy are coming forward and their claims that have long passed. The statute of limitations has long passed. Mm -hmm. So if you've got this short period for sexual harassment claims or going to the EEOC, how does that compare? You talked about comparing it to state law, but what about comparing it to like contract law, tort claims, or, you know, other normal kinds of claims that you might bring in, even in federal court? How long are those statute of limitations usually? Well, typically because our legal system is often set up to protect uh, commercial uh, transactions, contract claims have really long statutes of limitations. Um, personal injury, like negligence claims, have longer statutes of limitations. And uh, a Section 1981 claim, which would protect somebody from racial harassment, is a three-year claim. So this is something that um, it just differs from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but typically sexual harassment um, and other discrimination claims have short statutes of limitations. And that's another area where we should all be working to try to expand or to extend the limitations period. Um, I, I neglected to say one thing about arbitration that's a, an important practice point, which is it doesn't matter if the employer has a mandatory arbitration provision, you always have the right to go to the EEOC or to state EEO agencies. Um, so there is no arbitration provision that could um, muzzle somebody from going to uh, regulatory agencies like those. And uh, there was a 2002 Supreme Court case called Waffle House versus EEOC that made clear that the EEOC is not a party to that kind of uh, private contractual arrangement and that the EEOC can take a discrimination case to court even if there is a um, uh, mandatory arbitration provision. Why this is important is oftentimes companies feel very emboldened, they're not going to settle their cases, it's going to go into mandatory arbitration. And I'm very clear in saying, if I have a mandatory arbitration provision and I have to go to the EEOC first to exhaust my administrative remedy, I could publicize that fact. I could, you know, that's not confidential. So the employer is not going to get the kind of silence that it often feels that it is going to get. And I think that that is a tool that we have that we as plaintiff's lawyers should be making clear that I could publicize the filing of an EEOC charge. I don't know, but once you file it, once you file it and get a right to sue letter, you you then have to go back to that arbitration? That's right. If the EEOC doesn't take it up on its own. Yeah, and typically the EEOC is not going to, the EEOC is not going to take up a case where there's counsel involved typically, um, you know. All right, well, if we've got this really short time period, whether it's 45 days for federal employees, 180 for some states and 300 for others, well, what if you're in a situation where, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, say is Jane, most of the sexual harassment it, it occurred more than 180 days ago, but she complained to her employer and the employer kept promising to do something and didn't, and now she's 
the Me Too movement is emboldened her and she's finally like, all righty, I'm tired of waiting for the employer to do something. I found Debbie Katz as my lawyer. Uh, you know, what does the uh, sort of the employer delay? Does she get it? Uh, you know, has she missed her 180 days or her 380, 300 days? Or uh, can what the employer do uh, stay somehow stay that time period? Well, uh, we would like to believe we can make an argument that it is state. But it is state. I mean, the courts are going to say the statute is clear. Unless you enter into some kind of tolling agreement, which you can do, uh, but typically an individual, before they go to a lawyer, is not going to know that they can enter into tolling agreements to stop the, t the running of a statute of limitations. So if somebody comes to me and says, look, I really just trusted my employer and you know, now we're over this period, that's really bad. I mean, I'm going to make the argument that there was a deliberate attempt to pull somebody over the statute of limitations, but the courts are not really great on that argument. I mean, I could argue estoppel, but I don't think I'm going to get very far with that. Um, so, so there's kind but, of an incentive there for uh, the employers can kind of drag people along and then say, oops, sorry, time's up. That's right. In, in the wrong kind of time's up. In the wrong kind of times up way, absolutely. All right, well, let's let's move to, I want to talk a little bit about the continuing violation theory. So say we've got uh, Jane here, and uh, she's endured, you know, egregious sexual harassment for many, many years. But, you know, within uh, the filing period, uh, maybe uh, only a couple things ha uh, have happened uh, that maybe some judge might not consider that the couple within the time period are, you know, so severe that it constitutes are so per pervasive. Um, you know, can you tell us about whether Jane still has a, a claim or their arguments for a claim or what the continuing violation theory is to try to argue that she does have a claim? Sure. Well, what the continuing violation theory is with respect to uh, harassment claims um, is set out in the Supreme Court ruling called National Railroad Passenger Corporation Amtrak versus Morgan. It was a 2002 uh, Supreme Court ruling. And the court held in that case that there is a continuing violation for sexual harassment or harassment claims, uh, such that as long as one act of the harassment occurred within the actionable period, the entire claim uh, still comes in. So, uh, so the court in analyzing this, uh, distinguished cases of discrimination where there are discrete acts, like a non-promotion, something that is clear, we know what date that happened, versus a continuing course in an environment where somebody is subjected to a hostile work environment. And those hostile work environment claims would fall within a continuing violation uh, theory. Now, employers always argue, no, this new act is different than the other acts. There isn't a continuing violation. But if you can show that um, there was one act of harassment within the actionable period, all of it comes in. And this is really important because the standard for sexual harassment uh, that is not nowhere felt, uh, nowhere can be found in Title VII. But the Supreme Court said that the harassment must be severe or pervasive. And in order to show that harassment is severe or pervasive to make at that standard, you're going to be looking at the entire course of the employment. And while there may be different things like uh, some, some grabbing, some sexist remarks, some sexual remarks, all of it together is a pattern. And by putting together all of these uh, acts of harassment, we're going to be able to show that we meet the standard of severe or pervasive. Severe really talks about, and if it's severe enough, like sexual assault, you don't need multiple ones. Courts can find that a single severe incident can be adequate to make out um, a sexual harassment claim. However, um, this continuing violation doctrine is very important when you are representing people with uh, sexual, sexually hostile work environment claims. Because do you, ever run, do you run into to, uh, judges who just don't get it and think about these things as discrete acts where it was like, you know, oh, John Doe grabbed your butt on that day and it was uh, Tom Johnson who grabbed it the other day. And so therefore, it's two different people, even though it ha happens to you all the time. Those are different acts. Well, 
you know, conservative judges will find any reason to kick a plaintiff out of court. <laughs> and defendants will find any reason to try to distinguish things and say that this is different in kind. But the reality is, if you work in a workplace, it doesn't matter who's grabbing your butt. You're being subjected mm -hmm. to a sexually hostile work environment. But yes, there are bad cases post-Morgan where courts ignore the fact that uh, we're talking about a continuous set of events and try to say, no, this is different and this is actually a discrete act and you, you cannot make out a continuing violation. And that is the, that's a reflexive argument that defendants always go to. So the key there is that even though that doctrine exists, it still is another legal barrier or, that, or hoop that plaintiffs have to jump through in order to establish all the elements to convince the court that, hey, this applies to me. Yes. All right, we uh, we have a question here uh, back when you were talking about the tolling agreements. Um, uh, it says that if employees put their complaint to the employer in writing, is that enough to toll the statute of limitations or do you need an actual tolling agreement? You need an actual tolling agreement. And I always tell I always tell um, employees, you know, you can't trust those representations. If you don't get an agreement in writing saying that this will toll the running of a statute of limitations and we will not assert a statute of limitations bar. Forget it. You, you know, you, you've got to, you've got to act on your rights within the relevant time period. Okay. So uh, if you have to file this say within the 300 days, what about, uh, what kind of money relief can you get? Can you only get relief for those 300 uh, days that you endured sexual harassment or if it's been going on for years, can you get relief for the entire time period? You know, how far back can you go in order to get damages? If you prevail at trial and show that you've been subjected to a sexually hostile work environment, a jury is going to fix what the appropriate damages are with respect to that claim. They're not going to say, okay, we're going to award this amount for this period, this amount for this period. It is one claim uh, that extends as far back as the harassment itself. And certainly we so, see larger verdicts the longer someone has been forced to endure sexual harassment in the workplace. So you're not going to have courts instructing juries that, oh, you can only award for this particular period. Yeah, you're going to have courts doing all sorts of stupid things. <laughs> but, but, but the jury's going to do it. If you get to a jury, it's going to do what it thinks is right. Well, <laughs> I hope so. But uh, I don't know, Jessica, if you want to respond to that. But yeah, I mean, I think that this notion that uh, we can count on courts to give proper instructions and uh, not try to dice and slice these claims is, is just not, it's not realistic. Courts do that. And yeah, and I would just remind uh, the, the viewers about your point earlier about the damages caps that exist for uh, Title VII case yeah. claims. Yeah. All right, well, let's uh, jump to sort of the next uh, legal barrier. I kind of like to look at it as, you know, if somebody punches you in the face, you know, you get to go to the court and you can file a lawsuit, you know, for battery. But if your employer comes and, you know, grabs your private parts, uh, uh, you know, pinches you behind a form of battery. Can you go directly to court for uh, to file a sexual har harassment lawsuit, or or what is the uh, admin What are the administrative procedural hoops that you have to jump through that maybe the person who got punched in the nose doesn't have to go through? Well, um, you under Title VII, you have an administrative exhaustion requirement, which means you have to file an EEOC charge within the actionable period. And then you you have to give the EEOC 180 days to investigate that, that charge. And even if it does nothing during that period, you're just sort of stuck during that waiting period, waiting to receive a right to sue letter. There are some, um, there are some case law that talks about the issuance of an early right to sue letter. Some jurisdictions, uh, if the EEOC says, we're too backlog. We're not going to be able to investigate this within the requisite time period. We'll give you the right to sue to go to court. Um, some some courts, including the D.C. Circuit, have said that that is that is invalid. You cannot get an early issued right to sue letter. So essentially, wow. you're just sitting there for 180 days. Now that's different than the D.C. Human Rights Act. So I may, you know, go directly to court under the D.C. Human Rights Act and bring that battery claim that you've talked about with the grabbing. And Title VII is just not going to be my best remedy. Now, the problem with that is I don't get to go to federal court unless I somehow have diversity jurisdiction. And in some 
some jurisdictions, federal courts are going to be better than states and states better than federal. So those are lots of issues to consider, but you have to exhaust your administrative remedy before you can go to court. What happens if they don't get back to you in that 180 days? Well, at the end of the 100, and that's typical, at the end of that 180 days, I'm going to write a letter saying, please issue my right to sue letter so I can go to court. Now, one of the really- There you can can get it. Yeah, but one of the things that's really difficult for individuals is the title, the EEOC process is, should the plaintiff want to continue it as as a confidential process? It's confidential. it, there's not a public record of the filing. And one of the things, one of the barriers for people in coming forward is particularly in this day and age where everything is easily accessible and there's electronic filing, it's very difficult for someone to make the decision to go to court and file suit because their next employer is going to be uh, looking in public records to see all sorts of things about their potential applicant. And the reality is, even though it would be illegal, to uh, not hire somebody because they brought a uh, a claim of discrimination, all things being equal, HR departments are going to say this person, even with the most meritorious of claims, appears to be litigious. So, um, so we're not going to um, hire that person. So I have clients who have EEOC charges pending, and they want their case adjudicated before the EEOC rather than going to court because they don't want a public record of having been uh, you know, victimized by sexual harassment in the workplace and filing a claim. And it's just really very difficult that the EEOC does not have adequate resources to keep up with the demand. Um, and so sometimes they don't well, request the, the right order because well, I need the case st- resolved in that venue. One of the stats that I pulled up from the EEOC preparing for today uh, was that the EEOC under its data it claims that you know half of the complaints it gets it does deal with within that 180 days, but the other half uh, take an average of 1,200 days to investigate and or resolve. That's three and a half years. That's a really long time period. So, yes. w- yeah. you know, once you go, say you don't get anything back in that 180 days and you're, you know, you want that right to sue letter, what happens after that right to sue letter? What's the next uh, deadline or barrier that a plaintiff faces? Well, the deadline is 90 days to file your, your lawsuit. The barrier is that it's very hard to find a lawyer. Uh, and, and cases, these cases are really expensive to bring. And even though there's a statutory fee shifting that employers who, who uh, prevail in the cases get their fees paid, um, we often hear from people who are in their day 70 or day 75 and they're rushing around trying to find a lawyer to get their case into court and they haven't been able to find a lawyer to, during that time period. And uh, so that's one substantial barrier. Um, is getting to court within that 90-day period. Uh, One other thing that's worth noting is that after the EEOC issues a right to sue letter, I'm going to serve a FOIA request to get the files from the EEOC. And that's going to, as a practitioner, if the EEOC has done anything, I'm going to be able to see what the defendant's position statement is, whether they've submitted any kind of uh, declarations from other employees. And I'm going to want to have that as I craft my lawsuit uh, to be able to anticipate any defenses, deal with arguments that seems clearly pretextual in my complaint. And that's really um, during that 90 days to wait to get that that file. Um, it often doesn't come quick enough. And um, you, you really want to read that EEOC file such that it is before filing suit. So you sort of put all of this uh, in context, you know, in the Me Too movement, we're seeing some of these things where some of the men are turning around and, you know, filing defamation actions against some of their accusers. You know, we've talked about all these administrative hoops that the women must or the victims must jump through. You know, if a man turns around and, and files a defamation case, does he have to deal with any of that or can he go right to court? I think you asked a rhetorical question. Uh, exactly. <laughs> exactly. The whole point is, yeah. you know, once okay. again, the sexual harassment ca- claimants face a series of legal hurdles that others with other claims, even if they're related to the, that case, just don't. 
to. Face. Yeah, but I'll tell you one thing that uh, I want to. I wanna, but one thing that is, I believe, a, a powerful tool in this moment, and we'll talk to it later because it's attention, it's headline grabbing right now, is that when even if a sexual harassment complaint is is stale or the case has been settled, if someone defames the victim of harassment and says they're liars, they're a gold digger, or they're you know whatever they say, the, that woman has the ability to go to court immediately herself mm -hmm. on a defamation claim. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, then gets to take a lot of discovery. So we're seeing Bill O'Reilly right now yeah. uh, scrambling because three women uh, who brought claims against him and received huge settlements, I mean, in the aggregate, $45 million of settlements from Bill O'Reilly uh, that he says he settled to just protect his family and protect them from the inconvenience and the public um exposure but um he then when he stepped down from fox his parting salvos were to say these people were all liars and these claims are not meritorious so now they're suing him for sexual harassment and he just got killed yesterday in rulings from the district court in new york it's unsealing some of that information yeah and you know one of the things that we learned from the unsealing of that information and everybody should be looking at this because it's kind of shocking is that his lawyer negotiated provisions that required the woman who settled the sexual harassment case to then come back later if allegations came out to say the the evidence was fabricated, my allegations were fabricated. I mean, no lawyer in their right mind should ever, ever put their client in a position where they're agreeing to lie as a condition of getting settlement money. That's outrageous and it's unethical. Uh, the other terms of the, that we now know from these agreements, which again, I believe are outrageous and unethical, is that Fox then required the plaintiff's lawyers to agree to provide services to Fox going forward. And they did that to prevent those lawyers from being able to sue Fox with the next woman who comes along. And that's unethical as well. So I think that we're getting a glimpse when we look at these settlement agreements of how much effort is gone into muzzling people with threats of, you know, Trump's case, $1 million per occurrence uh, in the Stormy Daniels uh, situation. But in Fox, return all the money, pay my attorney's fees. I mean, and and these kind of provisions are for life. So they're very onerous. And we know from the Weinstein case where everybody says, how come sexual harassment keeps continuing? How do predators like this get away with this for years? Well, they lock people into terribly one-sided, heavy-handed agreements where they that can lead to their economic ruin if they, if they come forward. Right. We're starting to get tight on time, so I'm going to throw out a few more scenarios for you, and if we can kind of maybe uh, um, get off my soapbox. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's really important stuff, but we got time. You know, time framing. Yeah, you know, the other thing, you know, in our scenario, uh, you know, we've got Jane talking about how she really wants to hold her boss accountable. You know, if she wants to go after her boss, not just her employer, and say, "Hey." Uh, um, you know, I, I want to make I, I want to hold him accountable. Can can you do that under Title Seven? Not under Title Seven, no. You you can under a number of uh, states uh, state laws: uh, D.C., Massachusetts, Michigan, Missouri, Montana, New Mexico, Washington, California, Iowa, and Vermont. And this is something that we, as plaintiffs lawyers, really want to see uh, expansions in this way uh, in 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 state law. Um, if we ever retake the the, the uh, Congress, this would be a good thing to amend with Title VII. But as a practical matter, um, it's very hard. You can't sue ind individuals under Title VII. Now you can sue them for assault, battery, rape, uh, you know, other torts that may also be brought within the same uh, Title VII suit. Now, uh, we were going to kind of talk about uh, the idea of severe and pervasive and who's the supervisor and all of the legal hoops you have to go through to show just how high this severe pervasive is or, hey, uh, after Vance v. Ball, 
uh, who's a supervisor and uh, can hold the employer vicariously liable. Um, we touched that a little bit in the in the first program, but since we're running out of time, I'm kind of going to skip that and go right to what I call the insanity of the Farrer Ellerth defense. Uh, okay. Can you explain what that is? Sure. And I'll just note that uh, we have a paper that everyone has access to that has all of the case law in, in the areas that mm -hmm. you just described. And yes, there there are significant barriers. Okay. So the Ellerth and Farragher defense. Uh, it is created out of whole cloth, and it w it is an affirmative defense that the Supreme Court uh, has given to employers that an employer, if an employer can show that it took appropriate uh, preventative and corrective measures to prevent harassment, and the uh, victim of harassment un uh, inappropriately um, failed to avail herself of those kind of remedies. The employer has a complete pass. The employer just walks away, and even though there's sexual harassment in the workplace, if the employer shows that the woman never uh, went to HR, never reported the issue, even if the plaintiff had good good reasons not to, fearing retaliation, the employer gets a pass at sexual harassment, unless there is a tangible employment action taken, like a firing. Uh, this affirmative defense only applies to hostile work environment claims, but it is a terrible, uh, it is a terrible uh, doctrine for in, employees. So it, it seems like that, um, well, I also want to note that also for research today, there I was looking at uh, the Merit System Protection Board uh, did a survey of its employees uh, in 2016, and they came out and they said that uh, of the employees who have endured, who had reported sexual harassment, only 8% of them who actually went so far as to complain said that they thought that their agency uh, took appropriate um, corrective uh, action. So this whole idea of this defense and creating policies and procedures seems like it's certainly not doing enough from the point of view of the complainant, which also leads, if that's forcing you to first go to your employer, you've got to deal with retaliation. Um, and what kind of issues are you running into in terms of uh, uh, retaliation? Well, this is another area where employees are really, um, uh, there is a barrier to proceeding with a, a retaliation claim if the court deems that the issues that they raise concerns about it. So they have an HR policy. It says, if you believe you've been sexually harassed, report this to HR and someone is called, let's say, a bitch in the workplace, and they immediately report it to HR and they suffer retaliation. Well, there's case law that says that would be insufficient to uh, bring a retaliation claim. We would say they had a reasonable good faith belief that they were opposing sexual harassment, but since sexual harassment has a standard of severe or pervasive, the employer is going to argue it's not severe or pervasive. They were called this, this bad name once. On the other hand, if they don't complain, um, the employer comes back and says they unreasonably failed to avail themselves of our policy, therefore we have an affirmative defense. And the interplay between that affirmative defense and the standard for retaliation is very, you know, it, it really hurts employees. It is so you end up kind of in a catch-22 situation that when something starts happening, you go and complain, but uh-oh, it's not pervasive enough, and so they can retaliate against you with impunity. That's right. And, you know, this is a tough thing. I'm sure, Jessica, you see this all the time, too. And we actually, when our clients come in, they are being subjected to really egregious behavior and they fear retaliation. And we're trying to help them uh, ha how to navigate that. And we have to say to them, look, they have this policy. If you don't at least take steps to go through this policy, you're not going to be able to bring a sexual sexually hostile work environment claim later on because they're going to say that you didn't avail yourself. On the other hand, if you need your job and you you can't, you know, you can't suffer that kind of retaliation, let's figure out what we can do to deal with the workplace. And that's that's really important advisory work that we do all the time with our clients. So um, I want I want to jump to um, you, we've kind of talked about the Bill O'Reilly situation and about mandatory uh, arbitration. Uh, but in the Me Too movement, we're, we're seeing a lot of uh, non-disclosure agreements and non-disparagement agreements. How does that affect uh, 
sexual harassment claimants? There are two types of non-disclosure agreements that uh, that are at play here. And unfortunately, I think the media conflates these issues. There's one type of NDA that employers require employees to sign as a condition of getting a job. So Harvey Weinstein company had everybody under these NDAs. So employees felt like they couldn't they couldn't speak out. They couldn't take any kind of action. And employers deliberately create these NDAs in very broad ways where people fear that they're going to be sued if they speak out about egregious workplace uh, discrimination, harassment, wage theft, you name it. And um, I feel strongly that those NDAs uh, violate public policy and they should be gotten rid of. And Jessica will speak to that. The second type of NDA is if you settle a case, it is very typical in any kind of uh, discrimination case or other kind of employment case that I settle that an employer will require a confidentiality agreement as to the terms and conditions of the employment, I mean, terms and conditions of the settlement, but also a, a non-disparagement agreement that would prohibit them from talking about the mistreatment that they suffered in the workplace. And, and Jessica will talk to some of what is happening legislatively to try to get rid of those kind of NDAs. Personally, as a practitioner, I can't imagine that employers are gonna pay my clients adequate settlements if they fear that they can't do that in a confidential way. Because if they settle the case and I can then go forward and say, we just got a million dollar settlement, it sort of, in, the argument is that it encourages other employees to come forward as well. So I think those legislative efforts are well intended, but I fear the backlash in terms of cases not settling or settling for uh, much smaller sums. Um, now, you, you touched on earlier this idea of the of the damages cap, uh, but we hear you know, sort of the backlash to the Me Too movement is that, oh, these women are just out there, you know, trying to get rich off filing lawsuits. I mean, what are, what are the limited remedies really available to complainants, you know, under Title VII for sexual harassment claims? Well, we talked about Title VII. I mean, the maximum damages would be you're entitled to back pay, reinstatement, but your maximum damages for a large employer of 500 or more employees is three hundred thousand dollars of com of compensatory impunities. That's believe me, people bring these claims not to get rich. There are many better ways to get rich, including buying lottery tickets than than <laughs> well, being sexual harassment complainants. What are their chances actually of be getting reinstated as part of a lawsuit too? You know, say hey, they suffer retaliation or whatever, and they're they're fired. Uh, in theory, you can get reinstated as part of the injunctive relief, but how often does that really happen? Well, typically you want that order, right? And then if if reinstatement is impracticable, then they have to pay front pay instead. Mm -hmm. So you always have to make the demand for reinstatement. And I've had one or two cases where someone actually really wanted the moment of walking back in the workplace and say, I took them, you know, I took them to court, I held them accountable, I won, here I am back at my desk. Now those individuals who are willing to do that, and that takes a lot of gumption, the employer will pay them a whole lot more not to come back to work. So you know, a reinstatement order is valuable in these cases. But it, it, if you get the situation where, you know, you're talking about front pay and you run into judges that uh, say, oh, that's speculative and are very hesitant to uh, uh, give you front pay, even though there's evidence that maybe the employer blackballed. You know, like in Weinstein case, we find out that here Weinstein was out there lying about Ashley Judd and Mir Servino to make sure they never got hired again. Uh, you know, if that were an employment situation, you know, how do you how do you deal with that? Well, courts do say large, um, projections that show that somebody over many, many years is going to suffer uh, a certain amount of economic damages. Courts are going to say it's too speculative to look at seven years out, eight years out, 10 years out. But uh, in our jurisdiction, the courts will award front pay for about a five year period unless there are other mitigating circumstances, like if it's an older worker who's not going to be able to get a job. Mm -hmm. uh, um, or where somebody works geographically, there aren't as many jobs, you may be able to make arguments for longer front pay. All right, now, um, 
the final area I want to address with you before we move over to Jessica, and this is something that may be obvious to lawyers, but isn't obvious to the clients that walk in the door. And I call it the litigation sucks category. Um, you know, when you have a client who comes in and she she wants justice, she uh, uh, wants to see the right thing done. You know, what kind? What do you have to tell her about th this? Is the way litigation really is, and uh, you got to decide whether you really want to move forward with this. Um, litigation is really rough and awful. Um, there are some people that I've represented that it. Um, they had no choice but to litigate, and they found the process very empowering. But defendants take off their gloves and do everything that they can to try to discredit people in all sorts of discrimination cases, but particularly in sexual harassment cases where you have to show that the harassment was unwelcome, the behavior was un unwelcome. And employers come forward with all sorts of, you know, egregious stories to show that the person welcomed you know, being called a bitch or a slut at work. Well, you know, she liked that. She laughed. She told the same jokes. She grabbed men too. I mean, the discovery is disgusting. And to get compensatory damages uh, for emotional distress damages, you're you're going to have to be subjected to an IME, and it is very invasive. And what what is that for our attendees? IME. It's, well, it's independent. independent examination, but it's not independent. It's it's the dependents. Yeah. It's a dependent Decides family. which which doctor they're going to send you to to, you know, say you're a nut or a slut. Pretty much, or to ask all sorts of crazy details about the person's life to say no, their emotional distress stems from the fact that I had one case. I mean, this was testimony in court. Uh, her emotional distress stemmed from the fact that her father wouldn't pay for her medical school and paid for her brother's medical mm -hmm. school. So therefore, she's always been like an angry bitch. And mm -hmm. when we pulled the jury afterward, they were like, yeah, that's what really upset her. <laughs> you know, like, you're kidding me. Um, so the IME. Rather than getting, years of sexual harassment. Right. <laughs> so uh, litigation, I, I've been doing sexual harassment work for more than three decades. And I was much more sanguine about filing suit in my first and second decade of being a lawyer. And now I'm much more um, committed to doing everything I can to try to get cases settled up front so someone can go on with their life and not be a litigant. Because it's just that dirt down and dirty and just plain sucks. It is. And also people's lives are just frozen during that period when they're in court and they don't have much control of the timing or how, how invasive the discovery can be. So I'm a litigator, but I'm a litigator is the last resort. I really believe strongly in trying to get these cases settled. Well, um, since we're approaching, you know, we got, we're, we got five to one here. And so we've got lots of other uh, uh, issues that address legal barriers. Um, but I would urge people to read uh, uh, Debbie's materials that she submitted for this program and also uh, Professor Sperino, who was on the first program, her materials, which also included, hey, our adversarial system uh, is part of uh, the problem about uh, and what it makes sexual harassment uh, plaintiffs go through. It's kind of like the old debate about what uh, we used to, what we make rape victims go through in order to, to go forward in a criminal trial. Um, so I'm going to segue over here to uh, Jessica. We've got all these barriers. We've got the Me Too movement going on. There's lots of talk about, hey, uh, how do we bring down some of these barriers? So Jessica, I want to turn it over to you. Uh, talk about, hey, what legislation has recently passed or what legislation is pending uh, that can maybe address some of these things. Okay, hi, thank you. Um, so my name is Jessica Stender and I'm an attorney at Equal Rights Advocates in San Francisco. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization. We provide legal services and uh, brief services and information and legal representation, primarily around issues of discrimination, including pay discrimination, sexual harassment, um, and pregnancy discrimination. Um, so I'm going to get started, and as you've heard, uh, we've gone through a lot of the barriers and obstacles that exist for plaintiffs uh, with a sexual harassment claims. So I'm going to go through uh, today some of the legislative kind of responses that we've seen at the federal level and then an overview of what we've seen at the state level in response to these issues, in response to the Me Too moment. Um, I'll start with just a quick overview of the kind of extent of the problem. Uh, so just really quickly. As many as 85% of women say they've experienced sexual harassment. This is from an EEOC 
uh, task force report of the chairs of the EEOC. Uh, however, 75% of them ex who have experienced it don't report it. Some of the reasons that people don't report sexual harassment is because they think they won't be believed, they think they'll be blamed, they worry the employer won't do anything, uh, and they re re worry about both professional retaliation as well as kind of social retaliation or being ostracized. Uh, similarly, you heard some about retaliation. I'm going to talk some about the legislative proposals around that to kind of strengthen retaliation protections. Uh, but as many as 75% of those people who don't report sexual harassment, experience, excuse me, who do report sexual harassment, experience retaliation. Um, however, and this just gives you a sense of the extent of the problem, in uh, 2015, harassment complaints uh, comprised nearly a third of the charges that were filed with the EEOC. So it gives you a sense of how, how pervasive this problem is. Um, so, at the federal level, I'm going to give a kind of quick overview, um, starting with uh, uh, legislation that deals with the legislative workforce, um, H.R. 4924, the Congressional Accountability Act, so this deals with just legislative employees. It would extend protections to unpaid staff and a broader uh, segment of the legislative workforce. It would provide a streamlined and easier process for legislative employees to make complaints. Um, it would require, and this is a trend we're going to see as I go through some of the other uh, state law bills that are proposed, uh, it would require members of Congress to reimburse the Treasury for any settlements or awards that are paid out uh, due to sexual harassment or sexual violence. It would require a semi-annual report uh, by the Office of Congressional Workplace Rights on the state of sexual harassment complaints. Uh, it would require that uh, entity to conduct climate surveys every two years and it would require uh, the initiation of a reporting system that would track uh, claims that are filed. Um, HR uh, 724 requires um, each house to adopt an anti-harassment and anti-discrimination policy. You might be surprised to know that that's not currently required. Uh, it would establish an office of employee advocacy to provide legal assistance to employees about their rights um, and the options that exist to them, and it would require an employee hotline. And again, this is all just introduced legislation. Um, I don't think that, uh, I personally, and I think people would agree, I don't see this going anywhere in the current Congress, uh, but I think it's an important step to show what gaps are there, what steps should be taken to better protect uh, the legislative workforce uh, from sexual harassment and some of the kind of interesting proposals that have been made. Uh, Jessica, this is Kristen. Just to kind of emphasize, you know, you were just talking about the changing the sexual harassment situation in Congress. You know, we've had the uh, women in Congress, Democrats and Republicans, all join together to go and say, hey, we need something done. So even though we kind of got that bipartisanship amongst the women in Congress, you're, are you still thinking that, hey, n nothing's going to get done overall? I, I I guess I should uh, uh, just add a caveat. I think that some smaller provisions may go through, uh, and there may be bipartisan agreement on some of them. I don't think that the comprehensive bills that I'm going to talk about today will be enacted in okay. full. Um, and after we talk about this, these bills that deal with the legislative workforce, I'll then go into uh, some bills around the private workforce, and those um, I would not expect those at this in the current uh, Congress to go through. Debbie, did you have a okay. point? Okay. Just that uh, the House of Representatives passed this bill. The Senate has not taken it up. And exactly. I was actually part of a work group that helped with a lot of compromises come up with this new legislation. And we were told that the Senate was going to act on it immediately. And of course, they're not. So it, it's very disheartening. A lot of effort went into coming up with this compromise legislation. And uh, the Office of Compliance in Congress is it's just egregiously bad for employees mm -hmm. and um, it's amazing that the Senate won't act even though there's been so much embarrassment yeah um, I agree <laughs> um, so the next uh, bill that I'll mention uh, again this is dealing with the legislative workforce uh, HR 724 requires that house office certify on their payroll forms that any payroll actions that are taken are not connected to payment of settlements uh, uh, for conduct prohibited by the law um, and that House members certify uh, that they're not using uh, their representational allowance to pay awards or settlements under the CAA. Um, it also amends the House Code of Conduct, official conduct, to prohibit a member, delegate, commissioner, officer, or employee of the House from committing sexual harassment or engaging in unwelcome sexual advances. And it also prohibits sexual relationships between members and employees except between married individuals. 
Um, so that uh, moving towards uh, bills that deal with the private workforce, and again, we're talking at the federal level, um, the kind of uh, ones that I'll highlight are listed here. So they're in, I've listed them in buckets. So the first bucket, and this is how I'll also address the pending state legislation, uh, deals with uh, legislation that's going to increase transparency and re reduce secrecy. And as we've talked a bit about today, this kind of issue of secrecy around sexual harassment uh, that occurs in the workplace and any kinds of settlements that do um, come about is has been a problem in seeing kind of repeat offenders and issues that really go on, uh, you know, for a lot of time. And many, many women and sometimes men, the majority of them are women, uh, suffering sexual harassment because they're not aware of prior incidents. Um, so the first one, ending secrecy about workplace sexual harassment, it's HR 4729. It would require employers, uh, when they submit the EEO1 form, uh, that uh, large employers of 100 or more employees have to submit every year, uh, that they'd have to include the number of settlements paid relating to sex discrimination, mm -hmm. which of course includes sexual harassment. Um, the second bill, ending forced arbitration of sexual harassment, would ban pre-dispute arbitration agreements for require, you know, forced arbitration or sex discrimination claims. Uh, the third one, Sunlight and Workplace Harassment Act, would amend the, SEC, the Security and Exchange Act uh, to require disclosure of settlement payments uh, on those on disclosure forms for sexual abuse and harassment uh, payments. Go ahead, Kristen. Yeah, I was just going to say you're going in and out on us, so okay. Uh, be sure to speak to the camera. Okay. Is that better? There we go. Okay. Yep. Jessica, is it sort of the same group of members of Congress and largely led by women who are who are introducing all this legislation and yes. uh, people like to jump on it and get some good headlines for it, but none of this is really going anywhere? Would, um, uh, uh, yes, it, it's mostly women who have introduced these bills. Um, and again, there may be some specific areas in which I think there could be some bipartisan agreement uh, and some movement. But I would not expect uh, these bills as, as as they are as you know intact and the whole as a whole to go through. Right. Um, the next kind of bucket is to and this is again a, a trend we're seeing at the state level is to bar tax subsidies um, and deductions that are related to sexual harassment. You know, for payments that are related to sexual harassment. So these three bills deal with that. Um, the first one, HR four one four five one four, and the second one, four four nine five would amend the Internal Revenue Code uh, to deny a uh, tax deduction, a business deduction, for settlements or payments that are made related to sexual harassment or sexual abuse uh, if it's subject to an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement. Um, and it would also ban that tax deduction, that business deduction, uh, for attorney's fees related to those settlements or payments uh, made for sexual harassment claims that are subject to NDAs. Um, the third bill, H.R. 4748, uh, would also amend the Internal Revenue Code to de deny this business exception um, deduction for severance payments that are made to employees uh, when they're terminated for uh, sexual harassment or sexual violence, if that was a factor in their termination. Oh, wow. So when they paid big golden parachutes to, uh, yeah. to $45 million or something obscene to Roger Ailes, that's not, that's not a, a deductible business expense. Exactly, under this proposed Great. legislation. Nice. Um, the next bucket is legislation that expands protections and coverage. So we talked a lot about how just existing law often isn't sufficient uh, to protect employees from sexual harassment um, and really hold employers accountable. Uh, so these two uh, bills, the first one that I've listed here, which is H.R. 4152, deals with the issue of supervisor liability. We did not get to that and discuss that really in depth in the first part of our webinar, uh, but it basically would modify uh, supervisor liability standards that were set forth in the Vance v. Ball State University decision, which is discussed uh, uh, in full in the materials that we provided to you all, and I suggest you read it. Uh, but it really narrowed the scope of supervisor liability uh, for, for sexual harassment. So this would kind of amend that and kind of advance fix, so to speak, um, and not limit it to individuals, which the Vance decision did, not limit supervisory uh, supervisor liability to individuals only with the authority to take tangible employment actions, which really narrowed the scope of supervisors and individuals that can be held accountable for uh, sexual harassment. Um, it would hold employers liable for negligence of the employer uh, when that negligence of the employer led to the creation or continuation of a, of a hostile work environment. Uh, 
Um, the second bill, uh, Protecting Independent Contractors from Discrimination Act, would kind of extend, as you heard uh, in the initial part of this presentation, sexual harassment law applies to employees uh, and it's prohibited for employees. Some states have protections for other types of uh, individuals working, like independent contractors, but at the federal level, it's just employees. So this would extend uh, the anti-discrimination protections of Title VII, which include the sexual harassment protections, uh, to, to independent contractors as well. Um, and then this next bucket, uh, legislation to kind of promote uh, prevention of sexual harassment, uh, HR 5113, which requires sexual harassment training for employees of federal contractors. So uh, moving on to the states, as you can imagine and have probably read in the news, there is quite a bit of action at the state level of legislators wanting to address sexual harassment and take a hard stance. Uh, and, and increase protections for uh, workers. There's too many bills uh, at, in all the states to go into all the details. So I'm gonna do a kind of overview of, again, the buckets or areas in which we're seeing bills uh, pop up. And then, as you can see here, I've listed some of the states where, we, where bills are pending. And then I'm gonna go into some examples, more specific and more detailed examples of some of the bills that uh, we've seen pop up as kind of examples of, of ways that legislatures are dealing with this at the state level. Um, and as both Debbie and um, Kristen mentioned, a lot, several states have better, more protective uh, state laws against sexual harassment. Um, and that's just, you know, to know the federal, the federal law is the, the floor, uh, but not all states do. So some states have just the basic federal protections that are uh, in effect that Debbie mentioned. Um, so again, kind of turning to the buckets or issue areas in this pen pending state legislation, the first are we're seeing a lot of efforts to reform uh, the legislature's own policies and procedures. Um, so some of those kind of specific issue areas are uh, training, requiring increased training of uh, legislative employees and uh, legislators, uh, reporting requirements and public disclosures of harassment complaints within the legislature, um, and then also any payments that are made. Uh, again, limitations on the use of public funds to settle claims and requiring legislators to reimburse uh, payments that are made, settlement payments that are made for sexual harassment claims. The second bucket is increased record keeping and reporting requirements. So I just included one bill example here in California, uh, AB 1867, which would require all employers of 50 or more employees, so this is again private, not specific to the legislature, to keep records of sexual harassment complaints for 10 years. Um, next bucket, mandatory training. So at the federal level, there is no mandatory training. Uh, some states do have that, like California and New York and other, some other states, um, but this would increase or require training or increase existing training requirements to ensure it's more than just kind of what I put here, file cabinet compliance, like the bare minimum to avoid liability, uh, which as you heard from Debbie is not a lot. <laughs> uh, being held liable for sexual harassment is a pretty high bar. And so kind of ensuring that training really goes further in, in, in uh, clarifying for people their rights and how to uh, prevent uh, harassment in the workplace. Um, the, the next bucket Jessica, is- Jessica, on the, mandatory, uh, on the mandatory training bills, are those uh, geared more towards larger employer, employers or are there a number of employee limits on those, do you know? Um, they like if vary. You only have one employee. Are the uh, are you covered by some of those state bills? Um, they vary. Uh, most of them have a minimum employee requirement. Uh, one example in California, we already have under existing law, and again, this is a higher, better, higher bar and a more protective uh, pr uh, protection than other states and then than the federal level. But under California law, we have a requirement that employers, certain employers, have to provide training. Employers of 50 or more employees have to provide training, uh, sex harassment training, but only to supervisory employees. So the, one of our bills in California would expand that to require all employers that are covered by our sexual harassment uh, uh, laws here in California provide training and that it be provided to all employees, not just supervisory. Um, the next bucket, removal of artificial barriers to justice. Um, these are the kind of barriers that, that we heard about from Debbie um, that are not within the law, but kind of keep workers from often being able to bring or prevail on sexual harassment claims. So the first kind of uh, subject uh, area under that is limitations or prohibitions on NDAs, non-disclosure agreements. Um, and I have in settlements, but we've also seen them as, uh, and I'll go into some detail about some of these bills, uh, prohibiting NDAs as uh, being required as a condition of employment. 
uh, which is what you heard about from Debbie and kind of the Weinstein example. Um, and these are limited generally to NDAs around sexual harassment and assault. Um, the next one is limitations or prohibitions on, oh, got those non-disclosure agreements as condition of employment. And then finally, limitations or prohibitions on forced arbitration. Uh, and one issue that I'll mention when I discuss the specific bills is uh, the FAA, uh, the Federal Arbitration Act, which brings up some preemption issues. Uh, so I'll talk about how some of the state laws are uh, getting around that preemption issue or trying to. Um, so continuing on the kind of buckets of pending state legislation, expansions of substantive law is an area that we're seeing uh, bills cropping up. So as you heard, the substantive law is pretty narrow at the federal level. Uh, so some of the, the types of bills we're seeing is uh, either lowering or having no minimum employee requirement uh, for sexual harassment and other forms of discrimination, um, covering other types of workers or other types of people providing services like independent contractors, interns, volunteers, Again, some states already have this. So for instance, in California, <laughs> the golden state uh, for uh, kind of employment protections, we already do have sexual harassment protections for independent contractors, interns and volunteers, but we're seeing that crop up in some other states. And I should note, I've listed some of the states here, but these are not all of them. Um, and so this is just some of the examples of states that are looking at bills in these areas. Um, the next kind of substantive law type bills that we're seeing are eliminating uh, or raising the damages caps that we heard about that exist under Title VII, extending the statutes of limitation to give victims more time to bring claims under our, under state law, um, either modifying or kind of providing guidance on this severe pervasive standard that's applied to sexual harassment claims, and I'll go into a bit more detail about that, about a California bill, um, expanding sex discrimination and harassment to explicitly include uh, sex-based hostility, gender identity, expression, and sexual orientation. Now, again, many courts have already held that the federal law does include, uh, that sex discrimination and harassment does already include those types of categories, uh, but some states wanting to make that explicit in their law, and that already is explicit in some states' laws, like California. Um, either overturning the kind of, the, dealing with supervisor uh, harassment and overturning the Farragher-Ellis decision or modifying that uh, such that the liability is clearer um, and expanding the definition of supervisor to, uh, to be broader in terms of who can be liable for sexual harassment, so dealing with that Vance decision that I mentioned. Um, so to give you some examples of pending legislation, um, here in California, we have some bills, uh, several bills, uh, that deal with uh, many of those kind of issue areas or buckets that I mentioned. Uh, so one of our bills would extend the statute limitations, and again, this of course can only be for state law claims, not federal. Uh, so our current uh, statute limitations in California is only one year, would extend it to three. Um, and as Debbie mentioned, the statute limitations for these types of claims are much lower than others. So here in California, you have three years for contract, four year, uh, two years for uh, uh, personal injury, so really, this is kind of making it commensurate with commensurate with other um, uh, filing periods. And oftentimes, victims of sexual harassment don't come forward right away for some of the reasons I outlined, fear of uh, retaliation is a, a big one, uh, fear of not being believed, and often just the trauma of, of that, that victims have experienced. Trauma can keep people from being able to even face what happened to them and come forward. So a year really isn't enough time, uh, as, as you can imagine. Um, the next bill, SB 1300, would strengthen our state, California, uh, anti-discrimination and harassment law in many ways. So it would prohibit employers from requiring uh, employees to sign NDAs or waivers of claims as a condition of employment um, or, or, or kind of in receipt of a bonus. Uh, it would also provide guidance on this severe pervasive standard. So as we heard, the severe pervasive standard is a pretty high bar for sexual harassment complainants to meet anyway. But even given that high bar, courts have sometimes interpreted it in ways that kind of makes it even harder. Um, so kind of one way we're dealing with that in California is ex in, in this bill is to kind of explicitly um, uh, uh, explain that certain cases got it wrong. So one quick example, a case here in California called Brooks v. City of San Mateo, and this gives you a sense of how courts can apply this standard to really kind of not, uh, uh, not allow victims of harassment, even pretty egregious harassment, uh, to prevail. The Brooks v. City of San Mateo case was a 911 dispatcher was uh, groped by her colleague while taking a 911 call uh, under her shirt, under her pants. This person, the colleague, uh, the aggressor, actually was found criminally liable and served jail time, uh, yet the Ninth Circuit found that this did not constitute severe or pervasive uh, conduct. 
Interestingly, that was a decision authored by Judge Kaczynski, who you may uh, have heard about recently um, in the sexual harassment realm, uh, former uh, justice of the Ninth Circuit. So that gives you a sense of the kind of ways that we're dealing with that, at least in California and in some states, to kind of explicitly say that case got it wrong uh, and give, give guidance from the legislature to courts on how to apply that severe pervasive standard. And some states are actually, actually changing the severe pervasive standard for their state law. Um, the next bill, 1038. Jessica? What are they substituting it with? I mean, it's got to go, but what, how, how are you threading that needle? Well, it's, it's a tricky question. Um, we, there's one bill in Minnesota that sadly looks like it won't be uh, going anywhere. Um, and so they are still determining kind of what that language will look like. Um, the dissent by Ginsburg, I believe it was dissent, in the Harris forklift case, yeah. uh, which has to do with uh, conduct that basically creates conditions that make it harder to work in, that's a bit where we're seeing some of these legislatures going. Um, it's a tricky, it is a tricky needle to thread in terms of what makes sense and what is an appropriate standard that people can uh, use. I think it's clear to many that the severe pervasive standard has its problems, but unclear what that should look like. And I'm sure you probably have written on this. Is that right? Or no? on kind of what that yeah, standard so, should be. Some, and we get lots of calls saying, you know, what should, what should it be? be? I mean, <laughs> you know, so we'd love to keep this discussion going as we all brainstorm about how to, if we're really trying to eradicate sexual harassment, why does it have to be severe? Why does it have to be pervasive? Is it enough that it just is? Exactly. So, yeah. Exactly. Um, so quickly, I know we're running out of time. Uh, another bill is going to highlight 1038. So under our, as, as Debbie mentioned, under the federal law, there is no individual liability for harassment. Uh, however, in some states like California, we do have individual liability for harassment. However, in California, a Supreme Court case put some doubt on whether there is individual liability for retaliation, which is a bit odd because it kind of almost incentivizes employees or individual supervisors, I should say, to retaliate because they know they can be held individually liable for harassment. So this would clarify that there's also individual liability for retaliation. Um, the Unruh Civil Rights Act, uh, just to give you a sense of some state laws that provide sexual harassment protections to non-employees or non-traditional, not traditionally uh, traditional employees, uh, that applies to other kinds of professional relationships. Um, and so this uh, law, SB 224, would clarify that under that act, uh, certain people can be held uh, responsible for sexual harassment or libel, um, directors and producers, so dealing with what we've seen out of Hollywood, elected officials and lobbyists, and then also um, uh, uh, investors. So some people have heard recently about these investors, VC types, uh, harassing the entrepreneurs who come to them looking for uh, um, financial assistance. Um, and then finally, AB 2080 would prohibit forced waivers of workers' rights. So this deals with arbitration, and one of the ways that this deals with the kind of preemption issue that comes up when states try to deal with forced arbitration is that what it does is it prohibits uh, employers from requiring employees to sign arbitration agreements as a condition of employment. So it doesn't do what other state laws have tried to do and often find issues of preemption, which is to say that arbitration agreements are not enforceable for these kinds of civil rights. It just says you can't require an employee to sign it as a condition of employment. Um, it also says you can't retaliate against an employee for refusing to sign an arbitration agreement. Um, you know, that brings up the question of how many employees, especially low-wage workers, would even know to, to what an arbitration agreement meant and why they shouldn't sign it. Uh, but it's an important, I think, step forward in uh, the movement of um, kind of promoting that education of workers about why these arbitration agreements can be harmful uh, uh, to their ability to kind of really uh, gain justice on these civil rights claims. Um, one more example I'm going to provide and then move on to the last slides is um, in Pennsylvania, some pending legislation, and I'd like to give a shout out to the Women's Law Project uh, in Philadelphia who's been working on this um, along with some other bills. Um, so this deals with, again, legislative, uh, the bucket of legislative uh, employees. So to create uniform policies and procedures around sexual harassment for the Pennsylvania General Assembly, uh, it would prohibit sexual harassment explicitly and retaliation uh, by employees of legislative agencies. It creates an office of compliance to receive complaints and investigate. It does not have a time limit for filing complaints. Um, it prohibits NDAs uh, being required as a condition of filing a complaint, but it does allow if it's a voluntary agreement, an NDA or a confidential confidentiality clause as part of a settlement. 
Uh, however, if it's an elected official who's at, who's at fault and it's found, the complaint is found to be credible, uh, they're not allowed to use an NDA, um, requires legislators to pay back any funds that are paid uh, for settle settlements of sexual harassment, and it requires reporting of information about uh, settlements of sexual harassment claims. Uh, complaints. And I raise this again as an example because it kind of shows, although it's just one bill in one state, it really covers some of the gamut of areas that we're seeing in other states as well. And even though this is specific to the legislature, we're seeing these kinds of uh, proposals that are also applicable to private workforces. Um, and then I just wanted to raise that in addition to the kinds of bills we're seeing around employment, uh, employment related harassment, um, one kind of interesting area that I think is an important one is looking at going even before employment and trying to prevent take preventative measures and pass legislation that deals with employment, uh, deals with sexual harassment and sexual violence before we even get to employment. So I just give two examples of bills, one in California, one in Illinois, that require uh, sex ed classes to include information about sexual harassment and sexual violence. Uh, when students are learning about these issues early on, it of course can help prevent uh, sexual harassment and sexual violence later in the workplace. So the California bill would extend what we already have required uh, sexual harassment training in, in sex ed uh, uh, curriculums. It would extend that to charter schools. And then in Illinois, it would require that sex ed curriculum be changed to update uh, issues of sexual consent. Um, so just kind of getting these issues earlier, uh, getting students to understand these issues earlier is kind of a preventative measure uh, for when they're in the workforce. And then finally, I just want to highlight some uh, recently passed state legislation uh, that came up in response to the kind of Me Too moment, um, and I'll go quickly. Uh, so in uh, uh, February of 2018, we passed in California a legislative employee whistleblower protection, so it prohibits uh, uh, um, retaliation against legislative employees for speaking out about these kinds of issues. Um, in uh, April of 2018, New York passed several laws through their budget, uh, uh, budget process, uh, passed several important reforms, and I'll go quickly, reimbursement of state funds that are paid to victims, so that's another kind of trend that we've been seeing, and I'll give a shout out to a Better Balance, an organization that's been doing a lot of work on this in New York. Um, also in New York, there recently passed uh, uh, sexual harassment trainings include uh, mandatory training by all employers in the state have to adopt um, a model policy, model sexual harassment policy, uh, and provide uh, sexual harassment training to their employees, which includes examples of what sexual harassment is and what employees uh, can do, you know, under their uh, under the law to, to complain about it or file claims. Um, again, in New York, uh, it bans NDAs and settlements involving sexual harassment um, unless the complainant chooses that. Um, so if you come to a voluntary settlement and the plaintiff wants it or the complainant wants it, you can, but otherwise they're banned. There's a 21-day uh, period in which the uh, complainant can consider the NDA, and then there's a seven-day revocation period in which the complainant can choose to revoke uh, the NDA. A second part that um, could potentially raise some preemption issues uh, bars mandatory arbitration clauses for sexual harassment claims. And really quickly, uh, expanding sexual harassment protections for non-employees in New York. Uh, so this would expand it to groups like contractors, vendors, consultants, or employees of those groups. Um, and then finally, the last two recently passed kind of Me Too laws are in Washington, uh, just in April uh, in, this, in this month. One, it would prohibit employers from requiring employees to sign NDAs as a condition of employment. Um, that would prevent them from being able to discuss, discuss these problems. And then two, uh, a law that bars uh, mandatory private ar uh, arbitration, this issue that we've talked a lot about, um, when it's dealing with uh, sexual harassment or federal, uh, state or federal discrimination uh, claims. So I ran through those pretty quickly, uh, but I know we're running out of time, so I'll leave it at that. Yes. So Paula, do you want to go next? Or if we have any questions out there, we only have a few minutes. If people want to send them through the uh, question feature, um, or otherwise send them to Paula who can forward them to us after uh, the program. I haven't really been seeing uh, that many uh, run across here, so. Well, I have a question. Yes. Why are, all, why are we all not moving to California? <laughs> Where they have better laws on these issues? <laughs> they have better laws and they're really trying to tackle these issues. 
<laughs> you know, I, I guess I want to just raise this with the panelists because we all think a lot about these issues, but we are in this moment of cultural reckoning. How do we keep the pressure on so we really see legislative change? Because the laws are not good enough. The standards are too high. There are too many legal barriers. And how do we how do we keep the pressure on when when we run out of the headline grabbing stories or people become so inured to them? Um, so what are your thoughts? I mean, I, I'm very concerned about low wage earners, you know, low, that in this great moment of reckoning, they're somehow going to be left behind. What do we do? Jessica, you want to go first? Well, I think that's a, a big question, um, but in a really quick moment, I think making sure that legislators uh, stay aware of the pervasiveness of this issue. I think people have been, at least the ones that I speak to, pretty shocked about how frequent and common uh, sex harassment is. And I think especially for low-wage workers, you know, you hear about in Hollywood and higher paid, very uh, visible people not coming forward because they fear retaliation and really explaining to legislators and the public that that fear is so much more compounded for low-wage workers, immigrant workers who have, you know, maybe don't understand their rights, don't know the law. If you're undocumented, you fear immigration consequences. That's often we've seen and with our clients who are primarily low-wage workers, uh, a, a tool that supervisors and other harassers use to keep people from speaking out. They basically threaten to take retaliatory action. And so, of course, fear of deportation or other immigration consequences, but also just fear of losing your job. Um, a low-wage worker really can't absorb that. So keep, I think keeping the pressure up, keeping the public discussion going uh, so that people are aware that how pervasive this problem is and the real fears that people face in, in taking steps to, to address it. Nope. One of the things I get concerned about is people just presume, oh, it's a Congress that's not going to do anything, or oh, it's a state legislature where things are in gridlock, and so we're just not going to do anything. Well, that's kind of what some of these people want is, oh, so you don't keep up the pressure, you don't keep lobbying because you don't think anything's going to happen. Well, if you don't keep those things up, nothing will happen. All righty, I don't see any uh, questions in front of us. Paula, do you want to take us out? I hope not. Oh, <laughs> take us out. Uh, well, I just want to thank everyone so much for participating and for joining us. You guys are amazing, and I, and I learned a lot. So thank you so much. And we will be sending out a recording of this to everyone who registered for the program. So thank you again. Okay. And join Section of Civil Rights and Social Justice and the Committee on the Rights of Women. Thanks, everybody. Uh, bye. I'm signing up today.